let's get messy with math and cube design. Welcome to Cultic Cube, where we cube religiously. We make you better at cube and make your cube better. When I was first learning magic, I wanted to know how many lands I should run in a constructed deck. My friends had a ready answer for me, which they called the rule of thirds. 20 lands, 20 creatures, and 20 non-creature spells. I built a deck with 10 forests, 10 mountains, 20 stompy things, and 20 burn spells. That deck was... not good. Today we help you become a better deck builder, not by giving you a magic number, but by describing an extremely useful analytical tool called hypergeometric analysis. As I don't want to keep repeating that mouthful, I will often call it hypergeo for short. This flexible mathematical approach can be fruitfully applied to cube design as well. To explain these concepts, I am joined by my friends and cube design colleagues, Andrew and Parker. Andrew will teach us to formulate good questions that hypergeo can help to answer. Parker will consider how to account for players' drafting biases when applying hypergeo to cube design. Cultic Cube is supported by you. Please drop by my Patreon page and learn about me and about perks for patrons. Also, I receive a small commission when you make a purchase through my TCG Player affiliate link in the video description. My sincere thanks for your support. I'll define hypergeo and show how to use a hypergeometric calculator before turning the mic over to the experts. Calculating the odds of rolling a number on a six-sided d6 die is pretty straightforward. Our chance of rolling a one is one-sixth every time we roll that die. Describing the probability of drawing cards in a game of magic requires a different sort of analysis, however. The problem is that a library, unlike a die, changes in size. When we play a game of limited magic, we start with a 40-card deck, but we take out seven cards for our opening hand, we draw a card every turn, and we may draw extra cards. We generally are not replacing cards in our library, shuffling and resetting the game. Thus the odds of finding one unique card in the deck are not the same before the game starts and at other moments in the game. Hypergeo is a mode of probabilistic analysis that accounts for such changes. My question about how many lands I want in a deck can be approached via hypergeometric analysis. Let's run some sample numbers using the hypergeometric calculator at StatTrek. It is a free tool, and it's linked in the video description. Imagine that we have decided that our limited deck quite badly wants to be able to hit its third land drop on time. Let's calculate how likely that is if we run 17 lands in our 40 card deck, as conventional wisdom dictates. We input 40 into our calculator for population size, as we have a 40 card deck. For number of successes in the population, we will enter our land count, which is 17. Sample size is the number of cards that we hypothetically draw from our deck. If we are interested in how many lands we have drawn by turn 3 when we are on the play, then, if we ignore mulligans, we will have drawn 7 cards for our opening hand, plus a card on turn 2, and a final card on turn 3. Thus our sample size is 9. Number of successes is where we enter how many lands we hope to have found, which is 3. We press calculate, and we are interested in the bottom number, which is 0.84. This means that we have an 84% chance to see three or more lands by turn three of the game on the play when we have 17 lands in the deck. We can run hypergeo calculation to determine the likelihood of hitting our land drops on time using different potential land counts in the deck. It is important to remember that hypergeo gets a cumulative probability. Imagine we have an aggressive cube deck whose curve stops at four. This deck is much more worried about flooding than about getting its third land on time. Remember that with 17 lands in the deck, we have an 84% chance to see at least 3 lands by turn 3 on the play. We might see 4 or 5 lands, which our aggro deck does not want. This deck is happy if it can fairly reliably get its first 2 lands on time. So perhaps we drop our land count to 14, which puts us at a healthy 86% probability to see at least 2 lands by turn 2, and which reduces our likelihood of finding 3 or more by turn 3 to 69%. So far we have seen how Hypergeo can help us tune decks. Allow me to introduce Andrew, who explains how to apply such analysis to cube design. Let us start by considering an aggro deck, which certainly would love to have a 1-drop in the opener to begin the game. If we had 8 1-drops in our 40-card draft deck, we can see the odds of having at least 1 in our opener. 82%. That's pretty good. If we're on the draw, we get an 8th card, and we can see that our chances drop up to 86%. If we want to have an aggro deck be viable in our cube, and this is a benchmark we want to shoot for, how many, assuming monocolored one-drops, do we need to run in a given aggro color? 
In a 360 card cube, drafters will open all of the cards. If we assume that only one drafter is interested in a single color aggressive archetype, then running 8 of these 1 drops is a good starting place. But what if our cube is larger than 360 cards? How many more 1 drops do we need? This is another problem the hypergeometric calculator can answer for us. If our cube has 450 cards, and we sit down to draft with a typical configuration of 8 players opening 3 15 card boosters, a total of 360 cards seen in the draft, then the probability of getting 8 or more 1 drops from a total of 12 in the entire cube would be 93%. That's good news for the aggro drafters. Now this is an overestimation of some amount, because one player does not have access to all 360 cards opened in the draft, Firstly, because other people will pick cards and might take some of the one drops we want, and secondly, because we might want to pick a different card over any of the one drops we do happen to see. However, this does give us an idea of what kind of critical mass we need to properly support a good aggressive deck and have it be reliably drafted. This kind of calculation works best for highly parasitic archetypes, since this probabilistic estimation leans on the assumption that no one else wants the cards we want, which is generally true for many aggressive one drops. For other classes of cards, such as removal, that many drafters will want, this calculation becomes less meaningful. Another parasitic archetype in many cubes is the upheaval deck, which wants either the titular card or one of the many variants. How many of these variants do we need in our cube to achieve a high probability of the deck having access to at least two during the draft? With three upheaval-like cards, our drafter can expect to find at least two for their deck if the draft goes perfectly. A rudimentary estimation for the odds of seeing one of the two copies by turn 6 would be simply to add 5 or 6 cards seen on top of our opening hand, the opening hand of 7, and spin the calculator. 55% to draw our important spell by turn 6 is not great, which brings me to the final consideration for cube design, cantrips. Magic has no shortage of cantrips and card selection, and any blue deck benefits from having many of these to look for key cards and hit land drops. If we cast three cantrips that let us select between two cards each, we're going to be able to ensure we hit our land drops, play timely mana rocks, and most importantly, find one of these combo pieces. If we run the calculation again, adding six cards from the card selection we had access to, the odds become a healthier 73%. Hypergeo allows us to quite clearly see how powerful inexpensive card selection and draw is. Hypergeometric analysis thus allows cube drafters to calculate how many of a certain effect they need in order to achieve the redundancy that they are comfortable with, and it allows cube designers to take the deck level analysis to try and figure out what sort of effects we want when, and then we switch to the cube level analysis to ensure that archetypes are well supported. So design with confidence, and don't lead your drafters into trap archetypes with suboptimal support for their decks with the hypergeometric calculator. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andrew. Now let me introduce Parker who will wrestle with some thornier applications of Hypergeo to cube design. Now that we've gotten the basics of Hypergeo under our collective belt, there are classes of cards which make analysis more difficult. For example, burn spells are among the most flexible of removal. How can cube designers ensure their mono red player ends up with enough burn to close out games if the control deck is poaching lightning bolts? Similarly, how can one ensure that the big mana drafter has enough mana rocks when the entire table wants to play a signet or two? As a case study to tease out some of the nuances of Hypergeo, I'll continue the example of aggressive one-drop creatures in White Weenie. Aggressive white decks come out swinging from turn one, landing aggressive creatures like the iconic Savannah Lions. They punish their opponent's stumbles by curving out perfectly every single game. And so, having a one-drop creature in one's opening hand is crucial to the success of this archetype. Andrew's analysis showed us that, in a 360-card cube, we'll need about eight white one-drops to achieve our desired density of effects. But that prior analysis assumed that every one-drop in the entire cube wheels to the white drafter, which is almost certainly untrue. Consider Mother of Runes, a white one-drop so powerful and so flexible that she's earned the nickname Mom and sees play in cube decks from mid-range to combo. Or consider Ginger Brute, a dark horse aggro all-star who is theoretically playable in any color. These cards, and many like them, are less likely to make it around the table to the white drafter because they'll be poached by other drafters. Our naive initial estimate of eight required one drops isn't conservative enough to account for the realities of drafting. One way I like to alleviate this tension is with an estimation method Frank Karsten of Channel Fireball uses to classify fetch lands in the linked article. 
Essentially, we'll give each card in our one drop section a multiplier based on its parasitism in draft. Savannah Alliance is really only desirable in aggro, so its parasitic multiplier is one. In other words, Savannah Alliance and cards like it are pretty reliably a full card for the white weenie drafter. But Mom is useful in many white archetypes, so her parasitic multiplier is about 0.5 because she'll only end up with the white weenie drafter about half the time. When an aggro card is colorless, like Ginger Brood, one might assign its parasitic multiplier to 0.2, since it can be poached by any of the five colors. By adjusting for card flexibility like this, we see that we only have 6.7 out of our desired eight one drops. We can add one Savannah Lions and one or two more Ginger Brutes to get back up to our desired numbers, this time accounting for the surprises of draft. To summarize, flexible cards won't wheel around a draft like Hyper Geo assumes, but we can adjust our numbers based on the flexibility of the cards to account for this. There are lessons here for cube drafters and designers alike. First, for the drafter, we see that the more flexible or unique a card is, the sooner you should pick it. Wheel the Savannah Lions, not Mom. If this topic interests you, check out the linked video for more thoughts on how to make early picks in Cube Draft. Now let's reflect a little bit on the effects of this Hypergeo method from the designer's perspective. If you only had Savannah Lion variants in your one drop slot, they'd all be guaranteed to end up in the hands of the white weenie drafter. But it would make for a boring draft on rails. On the other hand, if you replaced all your Savannah Lions with flexible aggro cards like Mom or Ginger Brute, your desired numbers of one drops will skyrocket because those flexible cards won't wheel. For many cube designers, neither extreme is desirable. This introduces a tension. The more flexible a card is in gameplay, the sooner it will be drafted, and the more similar cards you'll need to provide density to the players. As a starting heuristic, try ensuring that around half of a certain effect, like aggro one drops, are extremely flexible. And then, of course, adjust this ratio according to your playgroup's preferences. Hypergeo is an extremely robust method, but, as with all data analysis, it's only helpful if given context. Avoid Hypergeo until you have sufficiently narrowed and defined your context, your target numbers, and the problem you wish to solve. If your only question is, how do I fix my trap archetype? Hypergeo is woefully insufficient, since the trap archetype is highly contextual. You'll need to study your cube's gameplay in order to identify specific numbers that your trap deck needs to succeed, and only then can Hypergeo give you meaningful results. One last note, though it may be tempting, neither drafters nor designers should try to achieve 99% Hypergeo chances for certain effects, because Hypergeo shows a cumulative probability, not the average number of successes. If you have a 90% chance to get at least two one drops in your opener, the average number will be higher than two. This is especially true for things like creature removal, which are often not cast on curve and can be bad in multiples. Thank you, John and Andrew, for having me on. You can find me on Reddit as Land of Mordor. Catch you later. Thanks, Andrew and Parker. A quick update about KubeCon. I am delighted to announce that KubeCon 2020 is a go for May 23 through 25. This convention is a celebration of our favorite format, and it features competitive drafting, roundtable discussions, artist hangouts, and side events. Check out our website at mtgcubecon.com for more detail. Registration is now open. I want to give a special shout out to Andrew for his excellent article on Hypergeo and Cube Design, linked in the video description, which was the starting point for this video project. And my friend Matt of Cube for Two has a recent video on hypergeometric analysis in which he establishes practical heuristics for cube design that follow from such analysis. We have lots more cube design theory here on this channel, such as another collaboration with Parker that discusses how to define one's cube design goals. Let's keep hanging out and chatting cube.